All right, uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, jump right in. Uh, very excited about this panel. Thanks again to uh, Secretary Raimondo and, and to our chairman, uh, Brian Moynihan. Fantastic conversation that we were standing on the, uh, the edges for and, and uh, applauding in the back room. Um, uh, my name is uh, Josh Parker. I'm the uh, CEO of Ancora, uh, where we invest in partnership with universities to build uh, thriving communities of innovation. I'm uh, joined by Dr. Megan Hughes, the president of the Community College of Rhode Island and a national commissioner. Uh, Dr. Wendy uh, Winterstein, uh, president of Iowa State University, and Dr. David Wilson, president of Morgan State University. Um, this panel is on uh, place-based innovation, and I have a very um, specific agenda myself, but uh, Deborah asked me if I would um, switch to being independent, and I think it started something of a trend in Washington. Uh, so, um, I think uh, we'll just start with a bit of a, a, a briefing. Um, while well-known innovation hubs in the US uh, around the coast capture the lion's share of benefits generated by the innovation economy, many communities across America are not part of the innovation ecosystem or part of a thriving tech regional economy. Uh, these communities lag in R&D and venture capital investing and struggle to develop and retain talent that could drive innovation. Uh, we risk in the country becoming bifurcated with high-tech centers that promote creativity and growth and isolated rural and Rust Belt communities that continue to fall further behind. Federal agencies plan to inject billions of dollars to stimulate the development and growth of new regional technology and innovation hubs, as we've been hearing about, and new research and innovation capacity. Uh, in addition, the planned uh, generational federal investments in research and technology development could help build innovation assets in these underserved communities. Uh, this is a unique time to bring together industry, academia, government to level up these uh, underserved and underappreciated areas um, throughout our country uh, through a focus on place-based innovation. Uh, so to our panel, um, I, I want to ask, how can we best leverage this injection of investment to expand place-based innovation and create these uh, new opportunities? Are there existing models that we should be accelerating? Are there new uh, things we should try? Um, and so uh, maybe I'll just uh, uh, go right to my left, Megan, and, and tee it up sure. for you, and we'll go down the line. Go down Thanks the line. so much, Josh. Well, some of you may know uh, that my boss was Governor, now Secretary Raimondo, <laughs> so it was phenomenal to listen to her give a plug uh, for community colleges. I would not have uh, joined the Community College of Rhode Island uh, had Governor, now Secretary Raimondo, uh, not really pledged to have my back as we led what uh, was truly just a full-scale overhaul of that institution. So thrilling to see her now leading with her values and her incredible intellect and drive at the national scale. Um, before I answer your question, I want to say particularly to folks in the room who kicked us off this morning and who have already shown up on this, um, this stage and spoken, um, really on behalf of the seven or eight million or so community colleges in this country, I want to thank you. Um, it's my inaugural visit with this council. Uh, I feel genuinely welcomed, and so that means, I think, on behalf of my students, my students feel welcomed and, and feel seen. Um, I, I'm going to assume that most of the folks that are working in higher education in this room are aware of the following quick statistics. Uh, for those of you that are in other uh, sectors, I think it's important that you hear the following. Uh, a third of all people going to college in this country right now are at community colleges. 50% of all folks going to college right now at a bachelor or graduate degree uh, granting institution started at a community college. Uh, so when I think about where the Brian Moynihan's and those of you who are working in the private sectors, you're thinking about your workforce, we're the backbone of your workforce. Uh, and when I think about what the role of a community college is, I really see it as twofold. Um, right before Thanksgiving, I sat on a stage with Secretaries Walsh and Raimondo. Um, it was a really interesting space to sit in as a, an academic leader. And I think what Secretary Walsh said so well uh, were the boots on the ground. So I've been listening to some extraordinary minds all day today, leading research, um, some of which I've never heard of. Uh, what do I want for the Rhode Islanders that come into my college, the 40,000 or so every single year? I want them to have every single opportunity that I want for my own kids. And I think uh, that means that can mean a couple of things. It can mean the boots on the ground, at scale workforce that you all need, 
for the hundreds of yeah. thousands of employees you need. It also actually needs to mean that my students have a shot at going to your institutions, which are the preeminent institutions in this country, and your companies, which are the preeminent companies in this country. And so where I think there's opportunity is building those pathways. Now to your question. Um, earlier this morning, uh, someone talked about sort of the early stage thinking, uh, and I think it was Michael Porter, around this sort of sector-based right. innovation centers. Um, and I'm all for that. Uh, but as a, as a member of the smallest state in the country, I think really challenging that uh, model and starting to think about sort of hyper-localized, um, uh, really responding to, I'll call it smaller regional economies, yeah. and I hope you're gonna talk about what you're doing in Rhode Island. Uh, we wanna be a part of that. Mm -hmm. What it means as, as a community college, and if you listen to what the secretary said, um, it's actually not rocket scientists. Rocket science, how do you get, and I know we have some in this room, uh, <laughs> how do we bring the folks that are either unemployed or underemployed into this workforce? Uh, you provide them with the wraparound services that they need. So when I think about this panel, and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues, um, I really, yes, it's about place-based innovation. It's also about demography and, and really innovating how we think about demography and talent. So excited to be here and look forward to hearing what the input from my colleagues is. That's great. Wilson. Well, um, I, I really come at this from multiple perspectives um, in terms of how do we take greater advantage uh, of building place-based innovation and spaces in this country. So uh, briefly, um, I am the president of Morgan State University in Baltimore. Uh, it is an institution that is an HBCU. It's a high research institution uh, with about 10,000 students, and I'm in my 13th year. So I bring that perspective to this particular question. But before Morgan, uh, I was a chancellor within the University of Wisconsin system where I oversaw both UW Extension and the 13 freshman, sophomore liberal arts campuses in Wisconsin. So I was the first chancellor there ever to lead two statewide institutions as I ran one half of the UW system. And then before that, I was at Auburn uh, for 11 years as the vice president there uh, with a charge, and it was how do you make that institution uh, in greater service to the entire state of Alabama? And that was around the time, Deborah, uh, that um, Michael Porter came forward with uh, his cluster theory, and I was one of the people that was gallivanting around the United States around him as well. Um, but um, I come from that perspective. And then last, I sit as a member of the board of directors of the Lumina Foundation, uh, where um, since the Lumina Foundation came into existence, it had one singular goal, and we still have that goal. And the goal is, how do we get 60% of Americans with a high quality credential beyond high school by 2025. Mm -hmm. And we started, that, that was 38% of Americans, we're now approaching 55%, so much progress. So with that perspective, I wanna come at this from where I sit now, mm -hmm. at Morgan State University, in the vernacular, smack dag in the middle of Baltimore City. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, Morgan is number one in the United States of America in producing African American electrical engineers. We are number one in civil engineering, we are number one in industrial engineering, and we are number five in the United States in producing blacks in all engineering fields. Mm -hmm. So that's a very strong value proposition. And when you look at science-based disciplines, uh, Morgan is also number five in the United States in producing blacks in all of the science-based disciplines. And so we have a faculty of about 700, and I begin to try and understand how that institution had been so successful over the years in churning out all of this incredible talent. Um, and a couple of things came to mind. Number one was, the institution had really, really been successful in matching faculty members 
uh, who had the mission of the institution, once again, in their vernacular gut. Mm -hmm. And they were faculty members who many of them had gone to MIT for PhDs or Stanford or you name it, but they came there for a different reason. And a different reason was they saw opportunity. They saw how to cultivate that in a way that would lead to more competitiveness yes. uh, in whatever spaces those students eventually went. And so this was my first stint at a career in the HBCU world, uh, even though I went to Tuskegee undergrad. And so I began to look around that space uh, to see if I could understand what's going on in this space uh, and are those other institutions, many of them, replicating what I'm seeing at Morgan? Uh, and the, if the truth be told, uh, of the 400 plus A better accredited engineering programs in the country, only 14 of them are on HBCU campuses, yet those 14 programs are producing, depending on who you read, nearly 35 to 40 percent of all black engineers in this country. Mm -hmm. Only 14 programs. So we really have the models that I think the HBCUs, they present to us an incredible model for scaling up innovation, closing these gaps, and make sure that the students who are getting what they are getting from these institutions are now in a position to really become those innovators of the future. The problem has been that there has not been appropriate investment in those institutions to enable them to scale up, uh, to enable them to um, invest in infrastructure challenges. Uh, but if we can figure this out, especially you know, given what um, I heard from uh, Secretary Raimondo, uh, and uh, kind of challenge these traditional paradigms, mm -hmm. challenge these traditional structures, and take advantage of the institutions that can really produce the talent uh, to enable um, our country to be competitive long term, uh, HBCU certainly uh, is a credible answer to that question. Mm -hmm. And so my last comment is in terms of perspective, um, in the late 80s, I was selected for a national, indeed international leadership opportunity in the United States. Um, by the Kellogg Foundation. So they funded um, about oh, 35 people, up and coming leaders, uh, over three years to just give us an opportunity to see the world, to go around the world and see what's happening in the world, uh, and we'll pay for everything. So they invested about $120,000 in each one of us. And I spent an awful lot of time in China. Uh, my first trip to China, China did not have a Western style hotel, they just had the China Star Hotel. There was no High, none of that, right? And so I, I, I began to have my higher ed career in the United States unfold by looking at these places I had been around the world to see how fast they were perhaps progressing and catching up with us. Hmm. At that particular time of the world's top 50 universities, China did not have one single university on that list. Today, they have almost 10 some of them are ranked higher than our Ivy League institutions. And so they're making these kind of unbelievable investments in the institutions and these research labs. And here we are, we have the best system in the world, but we cannot just make all of the investments in the institutions that traditionally have received the largesse mm -hmm. of grants and opportunities. And so I do have more to say about that, but I want to turn I'll this come, to Wendy yeah, because I'll come back to you on this we point are, are kindred uh, spirits. And, uh, but uh, yeah. I do want to come back to the point. But Dr. Winterstein, you know, is uh, leading a, a large land grant, you know, university in a in a largely rural uh, state. What what many you know, folks consider flyover country. Uh, how do you think about leveraging these investments and creating a model that that speaks to this talent issue that uh, that Dr. Wilson's really driving at? Well, certainly a lot of folks do believe that we're a flyover state. In fact, when I've talked to folks today, most of you haven't been to Iowa. And so I invite you to come visit <laughs> Iowa. I think you'll find like many companies when you come to visit Iowa that you'll see, you'll find gyms present in Iowa in terms of our innovation and entrepreneurship culture. So, so we are very committed to innovation and entrepreneurship and we have an investment in an ecosystem 
uh, that really says that we're prepared to take advantage of the federal investments uh, that have been provided recently in pretty significant ways. And I, I'd really like to highlight two of those. So we are a very rural state. And we think about a rural state, we think about agriculture, the food and agricultural system is really a critical enterprise for our nation. And so it's important that we're paying attention to it, investing in it, and seeing what the innovations are in those enterprises as well. Uh, because of the new funding, uh, we've been able to invest in climate smart agriculture, doing so between the university and with industry as well. So that's one area. And as we've talked today about some of the critical issues facing uh, the United States, critical materials have been mentioned several times. And at Iowa State University, we host the Ames National Laboratory, which is the host of the Critical Materials Institute in the United States, really looking at how we conserve rare earth elements and how we think about doing that in a different way, how we think about creating cleaner fuel. So, so really significant opportunities are occurring in Iowa. Uh, they're really uh, tied to this entrepreneurial innovation ecosystem that we are focused on. But to your question about workforce, we're a university of about 30,000 students, 25,000 of those are undergraduates. And we are at the forefront, I believe, in saying that it's not just about innovation for graduate students, for faculty and staff, but it's innovation for undergraduates. So a couple of years ago, we opened up the Student Innovation Center, 144,000 square feet of what we call creativity, where students from every major can come over and create and innovate. We have embedded now in our curriculum courses that are tied to innovation and entrepreneurship, and we believe that has to be part of the solution, that undergraduates need to know what it means to use their creativity, to have a different mindset so that they're prepared when they go into the workforce for a job with a company or when they decide to form their own business of which many of our students actually do. So undergraduates, I think, is the answer. Undergraduates understanding innovation and entrepreneurship is really a big part of the workforce answer as we think about the needs for this country. Makes a lot of sense. And I'm, I'm committed to getting out to Iowa and I'm, I'm hoping, Secretary, <laughs> hoping Secretary Raimondo spends some time out there. Although I, I guess she'll have to go to South Carolina first now. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I want to come back to this point, uh, uh, Dr. Wilson, that, that, that you were making, and, and particularly the, talk just a little more about your experience at Morgan State and this quest to be uh, the first R1 uh, HBCU, which, which I think is, is a sadly telling statistic about this underinvestment problem. But I, I'm curious your view on the impact that that designation and moving that direction, all the things that have to happen to achieve that designation and the impact that can have in the communities that you serve uh, and, and the communities around your campus as you think about how to, to spread that innovation activity and engage uh, those students? Mm. Uh, so there are currently about 105 HBCUs or historically black colleges and universities in the United States. Um, there are 10 of us that are R2 uh, in terms of the way the Carnegie classification of higher education um, classifies institutions, and R2 is high research. So 10 of those, 105. But there is no HBCU in the country that is R1, which is very high research. That's about 145 or so of those very high research institutions, about 138 of the high research institutions. And so several years ago, um, I began to speak publicly about the fact that if our nation uh, reached 2030, and it did not have uh, several HBCUs on the penthouse of research that the nation would missed, would have missed an incredible opportunity, uh, if you will, and that should not happen. Uh, and so I began to look once again at Baltimore City. And so we are the only public comprehensive doctoral research university in Baltimore City. And so our counterpart in Baltimore City is Johns Hopkins on the private side, and we have no aspiration. Even if we did, we would never get there to uh, try and be Johns Hopkins. We want to be an institution that is committed, uh, hook, line, and sinker, 
uh, to the opportunities in Baltimore City, in urban spaces, in marginalized communities, uh, and basically harness the innovation to be that anchor institution that is involving undergraduates and research. In essence, when we get to the penthouse of research, we just don't want to be like everybody else. We want to bring something different to that floor. And so uh, one example is that uh, we have gotten the state of Maryland um, after finally understanding that the future of Baltimore is intertwined with the elevation of Morgan. Um, we finally got them to understand that about three years ago. And consequently, now they are funding at the state level a state-funded research centers. And we come up with the ideas that we are thinking this is what is speaking to um, what we need in this region. And if you put forth the first tranche of investment at the state level, then we need to leverage that for our private partners. We need to leverage that for our federal partners. And so um, the state is now standing up um, a center for equitable AI machine learning at Morgan. It would be one of the first in the country where we know we are not gonna compete with Carnegie Mellon or MIT or Iowa State um, in, in terms of the kind of hardware around this. But we know that we have the expertise and we can recruit the expertise to make sure that, Deborah, however, we see machine learning in the future, however that unfolds in our country, that it does not carry with it some of the biases that we want to leave behind. And so how do we build those algorithms in such a way that they would be bereft of both explicit and implicit bias? And this is the expertise that Morgan is bringing into this dialogue uh, in the same way. And so, you know, the state has now funded about six of these research centers, somewhere between two to five million dollars every single year. Uh, we are now recruiting um, about, uh, 80 new tenure-tenure um, tenure track four professors to stand up the research centers. And all of them are speaking to a need that is not currently being met in that area and consequently to drive more innovation while addressing issues of inequity in healthcare and all of the other spaces as well. So um, we feel very good about where we are uh, in this uh, rating process. But this is not a ranking, by the way, it's a rating. Uh, and it has enormous consequences in terms of potential future investments because our systems are set up now where there's a built-in kind of bias. You know, it's, it's just a built-in bias that Hmm, if we have $10 billion to invest in university-based research, well, if there is no HBCU, that's this very high research institution, they must not be as good as this institution, mm -hmm. and therefore the decisions are made not to go there when, once again, being around this space for as long as I have, um, some of that is just not true. Yeah, I, I wanna come back to the, the community college uh, point as well because, you know, so many of our academic institutions have, have taken to priding themselves on how many students they can turn away. Mm. And community colleges take the exact opposite approach. How many people can we possibly get in the door? And without, without uh, trying to give a commercial for the work that we want to do in Providence together, I think you know, if, you, if you can speak to some of the ways that you think about community colleges engaging with industry and helping bring um, uh, underrepresented populations into the uh, technology and life sciences workforce. Uh. Absolutely, thanks for the opportunity to talk about it. Um, you know, I'm still thinking about what Secretary Raimondo brought forward and I'll do my best to tie it to what you just asked, Josh. Um, she's a very practical person um, and I think there are a lot of practical people in the room and when I think about innovation, uh, in the community college space, it's actually about building a college that's responsive uh, to the learners that we serve today. So not the ones that we served 50 years ago, which had an entirely different demographic. So who are we serving predominantly? We're serving adult learners. I think she led with a free college program in Rhode Island that many other states have adopted. When I think about investing in education and in equitably investing in, invitation, in, in education, it is going to be about the federal government stepping up and saying they're gonna increase its investment at every level 
at every institution, but certainly in the community college space. So now to your question. Um, she talked about, if you were listening, this concept of experiential learning. And then she quickly said, and I don't just mean internships. She said, I mean work-based learning inside your companies. And uh, we have some examples in Rhode Island that I think are promising examples, and perhaps the one that may have the most relevancy um, for this uh, audience is uh, Amgen, so big life sciences, biotech firm. And uh, I think so much about the values of that leadership and what they do and what you're about to do in Providence. Uh, it's really about exposure. Uh, my students have the grit, the desire, and certainly the talent to do this work. They just don't know what it is. When I reflect on what I was listening to this morning, how much I would have given for my students to listen to all of you, because they would have been so inspired and their worlds would be grown. So very practical request, please open your doors, invite community colleges in, show our students what exists beyond their neighborhoods and their zip code, and they will, re be respo they will respond by being the best employees you ever have. So I know what you're bringing to Rhode Island, and we are very excited about being a part of it. That's great. And let me, uh, Dr. Winterstein, just give you the, the last word here as we, as we wrap up on, again, this, uh, this connection between uh, industry and academia and, and how industry should be thinking about the talent pool that's created in places uh, like Iowa State. Um, so, so at Iowa State, we really see uh, the value of a very close connection to business and industry. Our research park, located just a couple miles south of campus, uh, has about 23 employees, 2,300 employees rather, 100 companies, and they are there because they want to access the talent. They want our students to be working for them year round, uh, not just in the summertime, but year round. They want to be there because they interact with our faculty and staff on discovery research that is really a pull to the industry. That's fantastic. Well, uh, we, we managed to pull it in in time, and I want to thank our panelists uh, for engaging conversation. Uh, and I encourage you to, uh, to double click on any of these conversations with them uh, during the, uh, the break sessions. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.